driver's license, please. U.S. Army Fort Detrick, once renowned for its biological warfare experiments. Today, more AIDS virus is produced here than anywhere else in the world. But it's being grown for an entirely peaceful purpose. To make a vaccine against one of the most lethal and perplexing infections ever to challenge modern medicine. Around the world, there's an intense scientific effort to unravel the complexities of this virus. Its prime target is a human white blood cell. Usually the linchpin of the body's immune defense system, this cell is crippled and on the verge of destruction. Littering its surface, hundreds of virus particles are budding forth, ready to spread the deadly disease. This is the virus that causes AIDS. Over the last three or four years, we have seen every one of our worst predictions confirmed. We've, many of us, felt like Cassandra, who could see the future, could speak the future, would be listened to, but would not be believed. I think from now on, the facts will speak for themselves. We are seeing the mounting number of AIDS cases in this country and around the world that we anticipated two or three years ago. We are seeing the devastating health effects, the health effects, uh, the impact on our health care delivery system. Those facts will speak for themselves. The AIDS virus, seen here in cross-section and magnified more than a million times, was first identified only two years ago. The disease it causes is also new. To begin with, AIDS was just an obscure medical curiosity, a strange illness affecting a handful of homosexuals and drug abusers in American cities. Today, the virus has claimed thousands of lives and threatens millions more. The AIDS virus is one of the simplest life forms on the planet. It belongs to an unusual family called retroviruses, only recently discovered to infect humans. Within its spiky outer shell is a protein core that protects the virus's genetic heart. These foreign genes can pirate the cells that they infect. The viral genes are permanently inserted into the normal cellular DNA of the infected cell of the particular person that, the, that got infected. So that infection of that cell is forever because the viral genes are now part of those cellular genes, integrated right in. This integration occurs when the short chain of virus genes meets the DNA of the infected cell. The human cell is taken over. Sometime in the future, the inserted genes will make copies of the virus. Not only is that cell infected for a lifetime, when that cell divides, the daughter cells will also have not only the cell genes, but also the viral genes. So infection of the person is forever. Bobby and her husband, Bruce, work at a New York hospital. Three years ago, Bobby had an unusually heavy period and was transfused with four units of blood. One was contaminated with the virus. Last summer, she was diagnosed with AIDS. I was scared. I, you know, I, I immediately thought back to the blood transfusions and knew, you know, that's exactly, you know, where it came from. And I was, first of all, very scared of dying. I mean, I, I've done a lot of reading on AIDS, being a nurse, and, you know, I, I know that the outlook was supposedly very bad, that people don't survive over three years and the patients that I've seen who've had the AIDS they were all very very sick people and you know just dying people. Bobby and Bruce had been married for less than a year when she developed acute pneumonia. The lung infection was the first indication she had AIDS. Well it was just unbelievable sadness that this would happen to her you know that uh, we were basically just starting out on our lives and uh, to think that instead of all the good things that you try to expect, at least at the beginning, that, all, that immediately it's going to be just, you know, sickness and pain, and uh, it's very unfair. AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. 
That means the virus severely damages the very blood cells which normally protect the body from infection. The commonest cells in the blood are the red blood cells that carry oxygen around the body. But there's a rarer sort, the white blood cells, that are crucial to the body's immune defense system. There are many different varieties of white blood cell, and together they form a complicated interacting system rather like an orchestra. The AIDS virus specifically attacks one particular class of white blood cell. Called the T4 helper lymphocyte, it's the conductor of the immune system orchestra. Invasion by the virus can plunge the body's defense mechanisms into chaos. The virus fuses with the T cell's outer membrane, injects its genetic blueprint into the cell, and begins the insidious process of taking control. The result can be devastating. It's devastating because, first of all, it can attack the critical cell of the immune system, the cell we call the T helper, or T4 cell, which regulates much of the function of our whole immune mechanisms, and therefore you get a lot of other infections, what we call opportunistic infections. Opportunistic infections means you have an infection by an organism which normally doesn't hurt you, but in this case it'll hurt you because you don't have proper functioning of your immune system. Uh, things that we normally live with can kill, in other words, because your immune mechanisms are so altered. Secondly, it's so devastating because it infects the brain. Um, we've known that over a year now. And infecting the brain, it can cause dementia and it can cause death directly. These are cases that often go unreported because they're not showing up as AIDS, but as brain disease. And people don't often know the virus is there. If the AIDS virus attacks the brain, the prospects for those infected could be appalling. In Boston, they're urgently trying to discover the extent of the threat. Okay, can you see these numbers here? Yeah. There are numbers like one, two, three, and four. Right. Also letters like A, B, C, and D. Right. I want you to take this pen and connect these circles, but in a special way. I okay. want you to alternate number, letter, number, letter. Okay. And try it and see. If two important questions must be answered. How many people show signs of mental problems, and what is the severity of their symptoms? Okay, <coughs> excellent. So you went number, letter, number, letter, number, letter, number, letter. Mark Greenberg and Alexandra Beckett have begun a long-term psychological study of 150 people exposed to the AIDS virus. Ready? Go. Some of their subjects have full-blown AIDS. Others, like this volunteer, have only a mildly impaired immune system. Already there are indications that infected people, long before they develop AIDS, can experience mental problems. And I used to have a real good memory. You could give me a list of 100 like items in the store and I could like read them back to you, frontward, backwards, what sequence they were and all that stuff, you know, and uh, I mean, now it's like, I go to the store for five items and I forget three of them, you know? Brain scans reveal the damage done by the virus. The brain literally shrinks and fluid, here in black, fills the space. Over 50% of AIDS patients may ultimately become demented. The complaints that we've most often heard are that people are having difficulty concentrating. Uh, we have commonly had people describe episodes during which they have a sudden strong emotion, unprecipitated by um, anything that, that they can point to, um, and that they feel they're performing less well than they used to at tasks that they are quite familiar with. Go. By repeating measurements every six months, it should be possible to pick up any changes in performance. Stop. The fear is, as the years go by, brain damage is something people infected with the virus must increasingly come to face. I'm less upset by it. I said, well, you know, that's just what's happening, that's what it's doing. And uh, <clears throat> I live with it, you know, I mean, diabetics live with the fact that they have to take insulin and they have problems with that. And, you know, I have this uh, virus and I live with the problems that it brings. There could hardly be two worse targets for a virus to attack than the immune system and now the brain. How many people are under threat? The way to tell is by looking for antibodies. About six weeks after infection, the immune system reacts against the foreign invader. Specific molecules on the surface of the virus stimulate the production of antibodies. The antibodies lock on to the virus, but they often fail to arrest its progress. People may seem healthy, but they remain infectious and liable to become ill. Most people infected with the AIDS virus do not have AIDS. 
If you take a group of a hundred infected individuals, each year about a dozen will develop early symptoms of the disease. With each additional year, a proportion of these pre-AIDS cases go on to develop full-blown AIDS, while another dozen previously healthy individuals become unwell. No one can yet say whether eventually all hundred will succumb, or whether some people can permanently fight off the virus. It's a crucial question because the numbers infected are enormous. In the United States, we're talking about uh, the best estimate I've seen came out uh, in the New England Journal in December 1985, about 1.75 million Americans. Uh, I would say uh, maybe half that number of Europeans. There are large centers of infection in South America. The number of infected people in Africa is very large. Whether that's 10 million or 20 million people, I think is the question, not whether it's two or five million. There are a lot of people infected in Central Africa. In the last few years, a lethal form of the AIDS virus has become widespread in several Central African countries bordering Lake Victoria. Political conditions make research extremely difficult, but Western specialists who visited the region believe that across the continent, millions are infected and tens of thousands are dying. In Europe, numbers are more certain. The three worst affected countries are France, West Germany, and the United Kingdom. At the latest count, there were 275 confirmed cases of AIDS in Britain and almost 2,000 in Europe as a whole. The United States now has 17,500 cases of full-blown AIDS. Well over a million Americans carry the virus without yet showing any symptoms of the disease. The epidemic is concentrated in Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York and Miami, cities with large populations of homosexuals and drug abusers. The same risk groups are affected in Canada and probably Haiti, both with around 400 cases. And in South America, homosexual spread may be a factor in Brazil, which now has 540 cases in the cosmopolitan cities of Rio de Janeiro and São Paulo. As for the rest of the world, so far only Australia is significantly affected, with 170 cases mainly in Sydney's gay community. But it's in Africa that the AIDS pandemic is at its most acute. It's hard to believe that homosexuality or drug abuse can account for the millions infected with the AIDS virus there. So, at the end of last year, an international conference was held in Brussels to consider AIDS in Africa and why the virus is spreading there so rapidly. Many African governments simply refuse to accept they face an epidemic that's associated in the West with homosexuality and drug abuse. If there is AIDS in their countries, they say it must be merely a few cases due to visiting Western tourists purchasing homosexual favors. It is a taboo, you know, homosexuality is culturally a taboo in our environment. And, uh, yes, uh, and um, with urbanization, poverty, I mean, it is easy for these young men who have lost their identity from the rural setting into the urban areas, you know, to, to fall prey to these, these practices. But the weight of evidence simply doesn't support the argument for homosexual spread. Unlike Western countries, the virus in Africa affects almost equal numbers of males and females. And this suggests the disease may be being spread sexually between men and women, something many scientists have so far been reluctant to believe. I have become more convinced than I was before that AIDS in Africa is transmitted principally by sexual contacts and principally by heterosexual contacts. There may be other factors, uh, such as the uh, reutilization of hypodermic needles uh, that haven't been properly sterilized. And some people have said perhaps insect biting insects like mosquitoes might spread the virus. But the one thing that's come through loud and clear is that AIDS is spreading in the most sexually active uh, people in a community, and particularly amongst the promiscuous. Uh, mosquitoes and needles do not select between those people uh, so very much. So I think it still comes down to saying, if you want to avoid AIDS, uh, avoid having too many sexual partners. Project Aware, Suzanne speaking. Yes, I'd like to ask you some questions to see if you meet the criteria for the study. All right, during the last three years, have you had five or more male sex partners in or from San Francisco? 
you have. If AIDS is spreading sexually between males and females in Africa, then is the virus now infecting women in the West? So you're afraid that you may have been exposed to the virus. Let me ask you a few questions. How long ago was that relationship? And um, was your past boyfriend uh, s sleeping with other men during that time? Women who, who need to join a study like this are in a difficult position. Uh, most of them have become aware uh, far before we exist that they have some reason to be concerned about having met the AIDS virus. Um, but they may not be very clear about what the specific circumstances of risk really are, and they may be very afraid to, to get additional information because for them, the answer may be more frightening than no answer. So by and large, women who end up phoning in and asking about whether it's appropriate for them to be tested are ones that have already wrestled with the possibility that behavior that is illegal, prostitution, say, or drug use, or immoral, lots of sexual partners without having told the current sexual partner that that's the case, may in fact not only be illegal or immoral, but may also have exposed them to AIDS. Project AWARE's field workers are out on the streets recruiting three groups of women, partners of male AIDS cases, promiscuous single women, and prostitutes. She tested about three months ago, and she's supposed to test again. So I haven't seen any girls. I don't know where they are. Either everybody's done. It's a difficult thing to get people to enroll in a study like this. There are no lists. You can't look up a list of prostitutes and call them on the phone and say, will you come in? Even if there were such a list, they wouldn't come in. So we have a very skilled field staff who walk these areas. And our reputation in the community is of people who can be trusted. All right. Um... Women who volunteer are tested for the virus and questioned closely about aspects of their sexual behavior that may put them at risk. Okay, how many men have you had sexual contact with during the last six months? <laughs> I don't exactly know how I'm supposed to answer that question. Well, I just tell me uh, approximately how many men you think you've had in the last six months. How many do you have per day? On the average, in the last six months, of, mm, about three a day on the average. About three a day? Okay, do you work every day? I work about six days a week, yeah. Okay, so... Let's see, six times three is 18, okay. So 18 so. a week? Yeah, so 18 a week, let's see. The arithmetic works out at around 1,000 partners a year. We have now enrolled and tested over 300 women. Um, the study is not complete, but among those early participants, we have found that about 4% of them are in fact seropositive for the virus at this point. Um, some people might regard that as very good news in that given that these are high-risk women by definition, only 4% are seropositive. On the other hand, that's a lot of women who have something to worry about. It's not only prostitutes who are picking up the virus. The AWARE study shows that promiscuous women with far fewer sexual contacts are equally at risk. It does bother me, sure. I'm, I'm very well aware of it. I have a brother who's gay, you know, uh -huh. and so I'm definitely... I mean, so you're taking extra precautions as compared to maybe a year or so ago? as far as safe sex goes. Yeah, and pretty much. More... And I believe in birth control. I'm a strong believer in birth control. Uh -huh. so. You're being fairly picky and choosy about who you're going out with anymore, is it? I always pretty much have been. So are women in Western countries as much at risk from the AIDS virus as their counterparts in Africa? Many people ask us about how much it's reasonable to extrapolate from the African information to information in countries like the United States. And it's a very difficult question to discuss because on the one hand, we believe that we know of no virus that has a sexual preference, that it does in fact attack lymphocytes from both males and females, this virus. On the other hand, the evidence that we have so far is that it doesn't do so with kind of equal success and gusto. And the question is, why is that so? There's definite proof that a woman can be infected via her vagina. Four women in Australia developed antibodies to the virus following artificial insemination with contaminated semen. The virus may not be able to penetrate the thick, well-protected walls of the vagina itself, but it can probably enter a woman's bloodstream via the uterus with its rich supply of surface vessels for the menstrual cycle. When a woman is infected, the virus becomes present in vaginal secretions, presenting in turn a danger to males. There's no evidence to say exactly how the AIDS virus infects men. Promiscuous males commonly have an inflamed urethra due to other sexually transmitted diseases. 
Possibly a small sore just inside the penis may offer the AIDS virus a route of entry. Condoms are definitely a sensible precaution. Homosexual anal intercourse has frequently been blamed for spreading the disease. Unlike the vagina, the lining of the rectum is thin and bleeds easily. The theory is that infected semen might pass directly into the passive partner's bloodstream. But the lower intestine is an unhygienic environment that swarms with the very immune cells the AIDS virus targets. For the highly promiscuous, this suggests a bizarre alternative route of transmission. The conventional assumption is that the active sexual partner injects infected semen into the anus of the repassive partner. This is possible, and unquestionably it occurs. However, a man can only have uh, an ejaculation so many times. These people have sex 20 to 30 times in a night, and therefore the transmission of semen uh, probably takes a secondary role to a more physical transfer of uh, infected cells. The rectum of a passive uh, homosexual is invariably inflamed. That means infected cells will be present in the anus of this person. A man who comes along and goes from anus to anus in, in a single night will act as a mosquito transferring infected cells on his penis, uh, going from one person to the next. So if we have one passive person, uh, partner who is not infected, he probably will get infected by the physical transfer of cells from one to the next. Uh, when this is practiced for a period of a year with a man having 3,000 sexual intercourse, uh, one can readily understand this massive uh, um, epidemic that is currently in progress. From all the various theories, one message comes through loud and clear. Safe sex means avoiding physical contact with other people's bodily secretions. Among the gay community, it would probably involve a use of condoms. Uh, and not only condoms, but a condom in between people to prevent the physical transfer of one cell to, from between uh, the recipients. Uh, this is inconvenient, but uh, given the choice of death or a condom, I'd choose a condom. There is another group of AIDS victims who may not follow even such simple advice. After homosexuals, intravenous drug abusers are the group most at risk in Western countries. Their habit of sharing needles means that withdrawn blood is often left behind in the syringe between fixes. It's the perfect way to spread a blood-borne virus. This association with behavior that is illicit or taboo is another deadly aspect of AIDS. It makes public education difficult and it exposes victims of the virus to undeserved prejudice and discrimination. Well, that's what hurt me the most, the fact that I was a nurse in the hospital. They all knew I was a nurse in the hospital. And I was right, um, my room was right outside the nurse's station, so I could always hear them talking about me. There was one nurse who actually refused to take care of me, which that hurt. I, was, I wasn't referred to as Bobby. They referred to me as the nurse with AIDS. And, I mean, I just kept thinking that if this is how they treat a fellow nurse, what do they do to the other patients there? The irony is, AIDS is hard to catch. Even though he's lived with Bobby for over two years, Bruce is free from infection. We take some precautions with ourselves. It's not like we have different kinds of laundry or different sense of, sets of sheets or different uh, uh, glassware or anything like that. You know, we live together, we sleep together, we're man and wife. Bruce no longer fears catching the virus. Its first weak link is that it transmits in specific ways and is otherwise very difficult to catch. Perhaps there's a second chink in its armor that could be exploited to treat those like Bobby for whom prevention is now too late. If an effective treatment can be developed, it'll depend on understanding the virus life cycle within a human cell. First, the virus binds to the outer membrane and injects its genetic core inside the cell. The virus genes are stored in an unusual form on a chemical variant of DNA called RNA. A special enzyme, reverse transcriptase, is carried by the virus to copy its genes into normal DNA. It's an essential step in the virus life cycle and it offers researchers a promising target for a therapeutic drug. 
Mitsuya Hiroaki, Mitch to his friends, has been leading the hunt for a drug that might stop the reverse transcriptase enzyme from working. He's tested hundreds of substances and narrowed the search to the contents of what he calls his magic box. All these 30 compounds show some promise against the AIDS virus, and most of them work in a similar way. They're all modifications of a natural molecular building block chained together by the virus to make the DNA copy of its genes. A small change converts the natural starting molecule into a sort of chemical full stop that poisons the virus. When it's incorporated into the growing DNA chain, no further building block can be added and viral replication grinds to a halt. To discover which particular chemical works best, Mitch has developed an elegant test. Both tubes contain living cultures of human T cells, specially selected to be extra sensitive to the AIDS virus. The cells on the left have been infected by the virus. It's just possible to see that the small colony at the bottom of the tube has shrunk. To find out if a potential drug can inhibit the virus, a small sample is added to a new infected tube. This time, the colony on the left stays the same size as the normal one on the right. This drug is protecting the cells and might be worth testing in humans. I think one always has to bear in mind that a tissue culture technique may not predict for what happens in a person. There are many other factors in a person. There's toxicity of the drug against various organs. There's how a given drug can be handled by various parts of the body. There may be inherent sites in a person that are essentially immune, so to speak, from the effects of a drug, where a drug cannot reach or cannot be metabolized actively enough to bring about an effect. So I think that it is a leap of faith to assume that because one has an agent that works in a test tube, that one will have an agent that will work in human beings. Near Washington is America's National Cancer Institute. Here, one of the most promising of Mitch's chemicals, called AZT, is being tried on 25 volunteer AIDS patients. I was scared about going down to Washington. I looked terrible at the time. I could just tell by how the people were looking at me that, you know, they might not have wanted me, because, you know. And I tried to look the good that day because I, I wanted so desperately to be in the program. You know, I made my face up, but I, I was just so darn weak at the time. But they accepted me in. The first day that we were there, they gave me um, the drug, but they just did it a one-day thing. Test dose. Yeah, I guess to see if I wasn't allergic to and that it was getting into my system. And they brought me to my room. It was a lovely room. I had a lovely view. I met all the nurses who were really friendly to me. And I was thinking, what's going on here? Everybody's being so friendly and nice to me. You know, why is this going on? Don't they know what disease I have? Hello. How are you today? How are you? Every two weeks, Bobby flies down from New York at government expense for a careful evaluation of how well the drug is suppressing the virus in her body. Yeah. How was it like? Not bad. It, you know, 45 minutes, but it was on time and everything, so it ended up being okay. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Step up on the scales, please. Okay. And we'll get your weight. 50.3. Oh, good. I was 49 last time, so another kilo. Very good. Gain. Objective signs of how well Bobby is responding to the treatment are essential. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? Okay. How are you doing? You. You. Sam Broder must try to decide how much Bobby's well-being is really due to the drug so, and how much to her remarkable determination to overcome the virus. Tell me a little bit about what's been happening since well, we saw Well, the first thing is, look here. There was a button there, and today I sat down and it snapped. I've put on quite a bit of weight. How much have you gained? I've gained, well, today I'm 50.3 kilograms, which I've never weighed that in my life before. How about your fevers? Any I haven't had any fevers at all. My, te my temperature is usually 37 exactly. Okay. So, no, things are going really well. Well, I'm very pleased. I, in all fairness, I cannot... You know, yeah, I mean, you don't know how pleased we are. Yeah. I mean, we are so happy right now. But you have to understand that, although I'm extremely gratified about your yes. response, I can't be sure that well. the drug that we gave you did this. I mean, it's way too soon to make that conclusion, but... It I attribute to the drug, though. I do. <laughs> I don't care what anybody else says. It's the drug. <laughs>
Despite Bobby's enthusiasm, there are many uncertainties about the drug she's taking. It may not reach the brain in large enough amounts to stop the virus there. It may have bad side effects. It may even turn out to cause cancers. It's only an experimental drug. Okay, we have your uh, BWA compound, and your dose is uh, 12 ml every four hours. Mm -hmm. But for her, it's a lifeline to clutch mm -hmm. onto every four hours, night and day. And how much of a supply is this? This is a week's supply. Okay. You know, I'm convinced that perhaps I'll have to be on this drug the rest of my life. But, it's, you know, it's not that bad. Okay, you thank go. you. You're bye, welcome. bye. Bye now. It doesn't have a good taste at all. I have to mix it with orange juice. But, you know, I, I just feel that the drug is making me better. During the six months Bobby's been taking AZT, she's had no recurrence of the acute pneumonia that almost killed her last summer. But less encouragingly, the level of white cells in her blood remains abnormally low. Bobby's immune system has been profoundly damaged by the virus. It does not seem to be recovering. Obviously, she's doing very well, and I think that her immune system is not getting any worse, so that even if she would to get another infection, it could be treated and she'd get better. And we have a lot of time, I think, now, uh, and I'm sure that certainly in the time that we have, a cure will be found. Mm -hmm. I'm confident of that. If a better treatment is to be found, it will probably come from a more fundamental understanding of the virus, particularly the workings of its genes. Like all retroviruses, the AIDS virus has three standard genes. The first makes the core proteins that protect the virus's genetic material. The second makes the reverse transcriptase enzyme, which is the target for the AZT drug Bobby is receiving. The third makes the spiky outer shell. But the AIDS virus has three extra genes that scientists have never seen before. One of them, called the transactivator, controls the way the whole virus replicates. The transactivator comes into play long after the virus's genes have inserted themselves into the cell's DNA. The virus can remain silent in this state for years. Then, for reasons no one understands, it suddenly comes alive. The transactivator gene plays a crucial role in accelerating this process. Without that transactivator, the virus is completely dead. Just can't grow. That was not predicted from anything we knew about other viruses. We had predicted that it would just replicate slowly, like most other viruses without its transactivator. However, we find, without its transactivator, no growth at all. That has an important implication for therapeutic uh, intervention, for making new drugs uh, for AIDS viruses. What we are always looking for are things that a virus does that a cell doesn't do. And this particular positive feedback loop is unique to this virus. Cells don't do it. It's a viral gene product. And what's very important is that it's a viral gene product without which the virus cannot grow. Therefore, we have a new target for anti-AIDS drugs. So there are hopes of a cure for AIDS, but the reality is still far off. What about a vaccine to prevent infection in the first place? Well, if a vaccine is ever made, then a plaque should be fixed to this house in Glasgow. For many years, more than a hundred cats lived here with their eccentric owner. In the early 1960s, a number became ill with an infectious form of leukemia. The local vet brought the mini epidemic to the attention of a pathologist from Glasgow University. And so it was that Bill Jarrett came to study feline leukemia and to isolate from the cats the virus responsible for the disease. It turned out to be a retrovirus, and Bill Jarrett succeeded in making a vaccine to protect cats against it. Well, the basic principle is the same in them all. You're trying to preserve a certain set of molecules which are on the surface of the virus. And the virus uses these molecules, they stick out from the surface, and it uses them to penetrate the cells of the body. Say, common cold going into your nose, these prongs on the virus, so to speak, stick into the cell, and that's the way the virus gets into the cell. 
And when, you're, when you become immune to a disease, like the common cold, your body has generated molecules which stop the, attach onto these spikes or on the virus and stop it getting into the cells. Now, the, the idea of every vaccine, and there are many different ways of making vaccines, is to preserve these molecules and present them to the body in such a way that the body thinks that it's the virus and responds to it. But these, the vaccine doesn't do any damage, of course, to the body. Bill Jarrett is coordinating one of the most advanced AIDS vaccine programs in America. He needs massive amounts of the virus. Larry Arthur can provide it. Here at Frederick, we produce virus under highly contained conditions, called P3 conditions, for protection of the investigators. Individuals have to enter through a limited access doorway. They dress in protective clothing. The air balance is set such that the air is negative to all of the rest of the building. The virus is propagated inside of cells that we keep in a large walk-in incubator. We produce somewhere around 250 liters a week. The, since we've been in operation, we've produced somewhere in the range of 12,000 liters of virus. That's 3,000 gallons. It should total up to be somewhere around 1,000 trillion virus particles. And probably we produce more AIDS virus in this facility than any place in the world. The virus is harvested every Monday and every Thursday. It's separated from the cells in which it grows and purified to extract the protein spikes. Many different approaches to a vaccine are being tried. One of the most promising employs an extract from the bark of an Amazonian oak tree. A few drops are added to the purified virus proteins. The mixture is placed in a dialysis bag where the two substances slowly react with one another like detergent added to oil. If conditions are just right, then the molecules of protein clump together, forming miniature particles called immune stimulating complexes, or ISCOMs. The theory goes these ISCOMs should work like artificial viruses provoking a strong antibody response to fight off later infection by the real thing. There's one way to test whether the ISCOMs work in practice. They must be injected into monkeys, the only species other than man which can be infected with the AIDS virus. Some of the monkeys in this facility carry the virus in their blood so stringent safety precautions are essential. This monkey is free from infection. It's been heavily tranquilized, so it can be prepared for inoculation with the experimental vaccine. If this monkey makes good antibodies, then many human lives may be saved. If it doesn't, a vaccine against AIDS may be impossible. Well, the first step in the vaccine is to see whether you can make it, and the second step is to put it into animals. There is no way of testing a vaccine apart from doing animal experiments, so that's in the monkeys. And the first thing we measured then, as I said, was whether the monkeys managed to produce antibodies against that. We have tried different doses of the vaccine. We had to start with very small doses to make sure it was safe and didn't harm the monkeys. It didn't, so we've stepped up the dose now, and this has produced a very good antibody response. That's stage two. Uh, the third stage then is to find a method of infecting the apes and monkeys with the AIDS virus and see if uh, our vaccination procedure will stop them being infected. Advance warning of the problems that an AIDS vaccine may face comes from similar retroviruses that infect animals. There's one responsible for a sheep disease called Visna that's so similar to the AIDS virus it's difficult to tell them apart. Sheep suffering from Visna have much in common with human victims of AIDS. The virus affects the brain as well as the immune system, causing a chronic disease that stretches out over many years. Some scientists believe the two viruses are members of a common family, the lentiviruses, a relationship that may not bode well. If the AIDS virus behaves in humans as the animal viruses behave in their natural hosts, 
then a human vaccine is going to have a lot of problems. Uh, the Vishna viruses of sheep and the goat virus, uh, first of all, they infect the cells of the immune system. Antibodies either are not made to the virus or they do not protect the virus against the virus infection. Just like influenza, it seems the AIDS virus can mutate to evade the body's defenses. The protein spikes are what count in the immune response. Key points on the surface of these proteins are recognized by the antibodies. By mutating at precisely such places, an extremely small change in the virus can defeat antibodies produced both naturally and by a vaccine. Antibodies made to the old configuration no longer bind, and the virus can stay one jump ahead of the immune system. And there's a second reason to doubt a vaccine will work. The AIDS virus can escape detection by the immune system if it enters the body inside a cell from another person. This foreign cell is then engulfed by a scavenging slug-like macrophage, and so the AIDS virus passes directly from cell to cell, bypassing any antibodies in the blood. Well, these are hypothetical questions, uh, and we don't know the answer to them. I mean, the only way you can do it is to try it, to suck it and see. I mean, we've got to make the vaccines. It was thought to be a daunting prospect in cat leukemia, for example, where there are several forms of the virus, but in fact, one uh, vaccine protects against all the different types. So we've just got to go ahead as usual in science and do the experiments. The initial results bear out Bill Jarrett's optimism. Blood drawn from vaccinated monkeys appears to contain a few antibodies capable of protecting cells infected artificially in the laboratory. But only time will tell whether they can protect an animal. Monkeys may provide help in an entirely different way. One species, the African green, carries a virus very similar to AIDS, and yet it never gets ill. Just why may provide new clues in developing both a vaccine and a treatment. It may also explain where AIDS came from in the first place. A chance scratch or bite may have allowed this virus to jump from monkey to man, where it later mutated into the deadly form we know as AIDS today. If you inoculate one species with a virus from another, an odd virus will arise in the population which is able to infect the new species. But for that to become a disease in the species, there must be certain circumstances, social or housing or uh, contacts, in which the virus gets a chance to spread. Now, many viruses don't spread very easily, and these retroviruses do not spread very easily. As you know, you need to have very close contact. And when a virus like this, it may have been around AIDS for quite a while, but not until with the arrival of the permissive society and, and the society of homosexuals. Uh, this is a very close contact epidemiologically, which has allowed it to spread. The only certain way to halt the spread of AIDS is to discourage sexual behavior that places people at risk. San Francisco is one of the cities where the AIDS epidemic among homosexuals first began. Here, a determined effort has been made to educate people about the danger from the virus. San Francisco is also where they've been charting the progress of the disease for the longest time. One of the earliest studies has been run by a British epidemiologist, Andrew Moss. When we began working on AIDS in 1982, the first thing we did was, we did was a uh, a study in this neighborhood, and uh, we found out that about uh, one in 300 gay men living in a mile of here had AIDS, and now it's about one in 30. In this gay area of San Francisco, there's been a tenfold increase of AIDS in the last four years. Well over half of San Francisco's homosexuals are now infected with the virus. They are anxious to do something about it. The participation rate was amazing. It's because the gay men who lived here wanted the disease to be solved. They wanted it to be understood and cure span and so forth. This man's lover died of AIDS four years ago. He's one of 450 gay men Moss has recruited for the study. The aim is to find out why some people exposed to the virus escape while others become infected, and why some who are infected remain healthy while others develop the disease. When all this first started, there was no information whatsoever on AIDS. And uh, when he was dying from AIDS, he had asked me to get involved in this program. 
Every year, a few days before Christmas, he arrives at Ward 86, the AIDS clinic, to become another statistic in Mossy's survey. You say, ah, uh, okay. I'd like you to lift your tongue up to the top of your mouth. Good. And stick your tongue way out. When I first started in the program, I was very, uh, I guess you could say worried, and uh, every little thing that would happen, like a cold or feeling warm or anything, would have me thinking that I have AIDS. And uh, after time passed, though, I started to put my fears away because the best way to work out things is just go one day at a time. And if the disease comes along, then disease comes along. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. The medical examination is only the beginning. Volunteers are also asked to reveal the natural history of their sex life, what they did, with whom, how often, and with what protection. All of your uh, sexual habits changed uh, since you were last here? Well, I used to go, uh, a few years ago, I used to go to the baths. I used to meet uh, men on the buses and on the street and stuff. And ever since the information on AIDS came out, and I've had a few friends who have died from AIDS, ever since then, um, I've really stopped doing all that stuff. Uh, what about um, safe sex practices? Pretty much, I don't have uh, intercourse with any mud, with anyone, because I figure that's uh, the biggest risk that you can be taking right now. I'll loosen the tourniquet in just a moment. The verdict on whether such sexual restraint actually makes a difference is to be found in the blood of Andrew Moss's subjects. Are there any signs that education is halting the spread of the virus? What we see is a flattening out um, after. Four years in which numbers went like this, numbers are now going like this. We see about 60 cases of AIDS a month in San Francisco and have done for the last year. Now, what does this mean? I think it reflects a major change in sexual behavior amongst gay men in San Francisco beginning three or four years ago. We're finally beginning to see the results of that in the incidence data. But I want to make a caveat. What we see, what we measure, what we count is just AIDS as it has been defined for the last four years. And the AIDS virus is a retrovirus, and we know that retroviruses can have lifelong manifestations. And it's possible that what's flattening out and maybe going away is just the early manifestations of the virus, and that we'll see new manifestations later on in its course. It's been suggested that primary neurological AIDS, or perhaps a kind of lymphomas, a subgroup of lymphomas, may be diagnoses that we'll see more of. So we want to be cautious and watch it carefully before we say it's going away. While the victims live on in the hope of a cure and those at risk a vaccine, medical science is still struggling to come up with an answer to AIDS. As many people celebrating Christmas in Ward 86 have learnt to their cost, so far there is just one sure way to stop the spread of the virus, safe sex. Some pessimists believe those two words may remain the only hope. confident of our ability, our technological ability, to solve problems. And I think that's given us a great sense of comfort in this disease, and I think it's a false sense of comfort. We, that is, we who work with the fundamental aspects of this virus, know how far away we are from even understanding its workings, understanding how it causes the diseases it causes, and even some aspects of how it's transmitted. We have many areas of uncertainty. Not the least of our uncertainties are how to stop it. Although there is some hope now for drugs and some hope for vaccines, we can't and nobody with reliability can predict when and if we can slow down the spread of the disease or even stop what appears now to be an inevitable decline once the disease begins. So we are a long way from being able to control it. To put it simply, we are in the presence of an epidemic for which we have no vaccine and no effective treatment. And that's as simple a way as I can put it. That was the final program in the Discovery series. Stay with us for a preview of next week's program.